All right, so we're sitting here in a world that has 400 parts per million carbon dioxide. As Brian very clearly said, that we haven't seen levels um, that high for a very long, long time. And in fact, if we go back prior to the Industrial Revolution, um, we were 100 parts per million lower. And I'm going to talk a bit about the time we last had a world which had 400 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. I want to tell you why that's important. So, um, I think this is the pointer. Okay. So here we have a projection for the future, and I'm not going to go into this too much because our next speaker is going to talk about future sea level. The red band here is the warmest scenario. If we carry on from now, 400 parts per million, and keep burning carbon dioxide at the current rate, sorry, burning fossil fuels at the current rate we're going, putting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the latest report, the climate change report from the IPCC says we will be at about one metre of sea level rise by 2100. Now it looks like we're pretty much on this trajectory. There are other trajectories that we'd like to hope we could be on if we could, if we could restrict our emissions. Now the key problem we have here, and this has been said by the previous two speakers, is that in this next hundred years and beyond, the main contributor to sea level rise is going to be melting of the ice sheets. The Antarctic ice sheet is a major issue, as Brian said, the gorilla in the room, because we feel like, we, well we know, that it can behave unstably and potentially rapidly, and we know this from models that Rob will talk about in a minute. And we worry that if the ocean is warming, as we've already heard, and it's starting to get into that soft underbelly of the ice sheet, um, that we may be setting up a situation that once it starts, and these ice sheets really do start retreating, might be very hard to stop. Because once you warm an ocean, it's an enormous thing to warm an ocean to three kilometres, as the Southern Ocean is. It takes a long time to slow that train down. So we commit ourselves, no matter really what we do in the future, to a certain amount of sea level rise. But we have options about how much that sea level rise will ultimately be. Now, the reason I want to come back to this gorilla in the room is because one of the questions we ask ourselves as scientists is, if you sustain 400 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere for a sustained period of time, what is the end game? What is the answer to this question? Where do we end up? How much sea level rise will we get? And this is where the geological record is useful, because the sort of world we're heading into, in terms of our climate and the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we have certainly experienced before in the geologic past. So there are examples we can go back to, looking at geology, the layers of sediments that record Earth history, and we can reconstruct what, how the Earth responded. How did the Antarctic ice sheet respond to um, a world that was warmer. Now, of course, the example has to be realistic. So there's, it has to represent the world that we think, it has to represent a world that was similar to the world we live in today. And the further we go back in time, the more difficult um, that gets. So, I want to take you back, yeah, sorry about the wiggly line graph, I'll explain it in a minute, but I want to take you back to a time um, three to five million years ago, let's call it three million years ago for, for, um, for the point of this lecture. And this was the last time we had 400 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So what this curve is, is a reconstruction of atmospheric carbon dioxide on the planet by using geological proxies, geological information. I won't go into the details here, but there are ways of working out the atmospheric carbon dioxide um, using clever analyses of of microfossils and geological data or geological information. So clearly as we go back many millions of years, if we go back 65 million years we get to the end of the graph, but at about 50 million years ago we were in um, the warmest part of the last 65 million years known as the greenhouse world and here we had carbon dioxide levels of about on average about a thousand parts per million. Now that's the world we're heading into. Um, on that on that business as usual scenario, we'll be at about 800 parts per million by the end of the century, if we do nothing to our current rate of emissions. Now you note that carbon dioxide has decreased through time, and this is roughly the time around here, 35 million years ago, during this decrease, that ice sheets first developed on Antarctica. And they've come and gone a bit, and they've been more stable down here, but here's a period that's of interest to us. 
because carbon dioxide was higher. So let's have a look at what that world looked like. All right, this is a temperature map of the planet. Um, and this is the temperature response three million years ago when we had 400 ppm carbon dioxide. This is a computer generated map, but we also have geological information to calibrate or verify this computer generated temperature map. The computer program and the models used to do this are the same models we are using to predict future climate. We're just running them on past climates to see how well they work. And the picture we get is that the world was on average three degrees warmer. Okay, we haven't seen a lot of warming yet, and we've already put 100 parts per million into the, into the atmosphere, but as we, has been pointed out, much of that heat's gone into the ocean. But ultimately, the surface warms at both polar regions, and these red colours represent seven to eight degrees warmer temperatures. So the average warming has doubled in the polar regions. And this is because of very powerful feedbacks that um, occur in these regions. We see this happening in the Arctic already. The sea ice is disappearing from the Arctic and by 20, 2050, halfway through the century, it will be gone. But we also get the very powerful feedback ultimately that warms, provides this amplified warming in the Antarctic. Clearly this is of a concern because this is where all that water is sitting, frozen in ice. Okay. All right, just to prob, this figure's really just to jog my memory more than yours, but what I wanted to say, and I'm not going to go into the detail, if we go away from the ice sheets and we go to different parts of the world, there are places where we find information of old shorelines, of times in the past, three million years ago, when sea level was higher. New Zealand has a wonderful record in Wanganui Basin of these higher sea levels. If we average all the information around the world, and bearing in mind it's a little bit uneven depending on where you are, we end up with a number of 20 metre higher sea level the last time, the 3 million years ago when we had 400 parts per million. So is this the end game? Is this where we're heading? 20 metres of sea level rise. Let's go back to the ice sheets and see what, and find out what we know about the ice sheets. So what I do as a scientist and what Brian alluded to is that I, I work with geological data and I'm particularly interested in geological um, records near the ice sheet. So we put drill rigs on the ice sheet and, um, and we drill through the ice shelves and we drill into the sediments um, below the ice sheet. And these sediments have accumulated over millions of years and they hold a rich archive of information that can tell us how warm the ocean was back then, what was growing on land, how extensive the ice sheet was, was it larger or smaller, um, can give us a range of climate information that we can then use to verify and um, understand our models. So in this project, Andrew, big international project, um, we drilled back, we drilled a hole in the Ross Sea through the Ross Ice Shelf in, a, in this area of West Antarctica that we've been hearing about is getting essentially um, attacked by this warm ocean and we worry about the vulnerability of this ice sheet. So we were testing in the past what happened to this ice sheet from information we were getting in the Ross Sea region. Now to get cut to the chase, we got different types of rocks that represented different types of environments. And what we saw three million years ago were these green things. Green rocks, they really were bright green and what they were were the rem remains of, they were fossil algae. So there were algal blooms in a warm ocean occurring in the Ross Sea where now the ocean is minus one degrees, maybe even more than that, minus 1 1.2, 0.3. Back then it was up to five degrees Celsius and it didn't have any sea ice, it had no ice nearby, couldn't, really couldn't support an ice sheet with temperatures that warm um, and was, was experiencing algal blooms. Of course there were times when the ice sheet looked very much like it does today and times when the ice sheet was bigger. But three million years ago it looked largely like this. And our interpretation was that this sort of environment, ocean this warm, could not support an ice sheet in West Antarctica. Because remember that ice sheet sits below sea level and is vulnerable to that warm ocean. So that's where we drilled. and. All this blue area here under the West Antarctic ice sheet, so if I just pop back again, whoop, you can see this is the West Antarctic ice sheet here. If I pull the ice sheet off, this is what the bedrock topography looks like underneath. And all the blue colours 
and the next speaker will talk a bit more about this, but this blue area are very deep basins below sea level. So when you've got warm oceans all the way around this ice sheet and penetrating into those deep basins, it's hard to sustain stain an ice sheet. Okay, now I'm just really setting up the next speaker. It, it, and, and what this is an ice sheet model for that same time period. Remember we had a big ice sheet here and you know, we have a drill core which tells us some very site specific information. But we need to work with a model and a modeler like the next speaker, Rob DeConto, to explore whether what we're seeing in this drill core and what, well, what it means further afield. What are the implications of the climate we're seeing here? So Rob drove his model um, with the sort of climate forcing that we believe we had three million years ago with 400 parts per million carbon dioxide with a warm ocean up to five degrees warmer and this is what happens. I'll let him continue the story but the um, bottom line is from Antarctica you can see you've lost ice here, you've lost ice up in these basins around East Antarctica that are already beginning to warm today and you had a 17 metre contribution to sea level rise. I haven't talked about Greenland. Greenland also melted and potentially gave us five metres. So remember I said from other evidence sea level could have been 20 metres higher. Um, we've gone to the ice sheets and there's work on Greenland ice sheet I haven't talked about and we've looked at the proximal evidence from the geologic record and we've looked at the ice sheet models and it agrees. It looks like what we're seeing in these raised shorelines 20 metres higher in Wanganui or elsewhere matches with the amount of ice that we estimate has gone from the ice sheets three million years ago. Okay, so I'm going to wrap up. I think that's my last slide. Um, yeah, it is my last slide. Um, and just, just on this final point that what we're seeing here is an equilibrium response. It's not what's happening right now. This is the picture we get after maybe de well, centuries and maybe a thousand years. And Rob will talk a bit more about how fast these processes can occur. But this is the trajectory we're on. And there's a very important um, concept here, which is climate change commitment. How much of this are we already committed to? And we don't know fully the answer of that. We know that if we keep doing this, keep it at 400 parts per million, this is where we'll end up. Now just to put that into context, to avoid 400 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, to get things under that and to keep the temperature below 2 degrees rise in sea level, <coughs> sorry, to keep the temperature below a 2 degrees rise in global temperature, um, what, what would we have to do as, as a human community? We could burn fossil fuels for the next decade or so, but the, as we are now, at the same rate, but we would have to peak and then we would have to drop all emissions on the planet. All emissions of carbon dioxide to zero by 2100, by the end of the century. That's what it would take to avoid two degrees of warming. That's a bit of a sobering note to leave you on, but that's where I'll finish and I'll <laughs> hand over.